our, our first speaker is the Honorable Lord Harry Wolf. I will mention only a few of his extraordinary achievements in his strive for justice and civil rights. Lord Wolfe served as Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. P prior to that, he was Master of the Rolls, an office which exists since the 13th century, I suppose. Uh, he was also the first President of the Courts of England and Wales. Until recently, he served as the non-permanent judge of the Court of, fin of Final Appeal of Hong Kong, as well as the first President of the Qatar Financial Center Civil and Commercial Court. Today, as many of us learned from this morning's papers of the abusive treatment of prisoners in Israeli prisons, it is worth mentioning Lord Wolfe's report on the British prison system, which became a cornerstone for enhancing civil justice for prisoners. And we really think that it is something that we have to look up to and an issue that um, uh, we appreciate it very much. It's one of the issues that you stand for. Uh, I'm really mentioned only very, very few of uh, 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 Lord Harry Wolfe um, uh, career, uh, a few, uh, few um, uh, uh, milestones. And I will also mention that in addition, Lord Wolfe is the patron of the Wolfe Institute in Cambridge that Hagit already mentioned a little while ago, with which our research center at the Open University has an ongoing scholarly collaboration. And of course, we are all grateful for Lord Wolfe for eight years activity as the Chancellor of the Open University of Israel. Uh, I'm inviting Lord Wolf to speak on the importance of the rule of law to the interface world. Please. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be in this uh, lovely lecture theater and to be discussing uh, a subject which is very close to my heart as P Professor Brett Zion exactly Cloman has explained uh, with uh, colleagues who I've known for a very long uh, time. It is an, an important uh, subject and one where the developments in the law which have taken place both uh, in this country and in my country have been very significant in, I believe, leading the way forward uh, around uh, the different parts of uh, the judicial systems of many countries. The, as I indicated uh, yesterday, when I was being so remarkably honored by the President Hagit and, uh, uh, in her remarks and by President uh, Dorit ben ben Bainish, who is my successor as Chancellor, the Anglo-Israeli judicial exchanges were a huge success. At the time they first took place, they were quite a rarity of the judicial scene, and I believe that they became a model in many countries of the sort of exchanges which are desirable. And uh, they were particularly successful, as I see it, between British judges and Israeli judges because we share a complete commitment uh, to the common law and indeed as part of the common law, the rule of law. <coughs> we also share the fact that we have no conventional co written constitution. And that has meant that in both jurisdictions it has been appropriate and important that judges play an active part in developing our respective legal systems. 
And uh, what uh, we English judges found when we visited and talked with our Israeli colleagues is that they had an understanding of the role of judges which uh, we had need to follow because they had been working in circumstances of acute difficulty because of the situation of the state of Israel with its neighbors and the fact that this is a f fascinating uh, society from the point of view of the subjects we're going to be talking about because it of course has uh, not only uh, people of, of the Jewish faith who've come from all parts of the world here to make it uh, their home, but in addition, it has a very substantial Arab minority. And that meant, in, in my, to my eyes at any rate, that it was extremely important that uh, justice should work effectively within uh, that uh, context. The position in England was not dissimilar. Because of our Commonwealth, we've had a source of immigration from one third of the world. There was a time when I was growing up and was young, when if you looked at a map, one third of the globe would be painted red. Of course, those countries have now become independent nations within the umbrella of the Commonwealth system. It's an amazing entity in itself. It's a situation where because of shared or values, countries agree, notwithstanding that they are now sovereign states, to accept the umbrella of the Commonwealth with the Queen, either as the monarch of those countries, as in my country, or as head of the Commonwealth. But where uh, they have values which they are all working towards, which are very important within those societies, but also where there is a natural view of those who live in those countries that uh, Britain is a second home for them. And so when the situations are difficult in those countries, sometimes as refugees, but sometimes as immigrants, they feel a desire to come uh, and establish themselves in uh, the UK. And now, if Israel has a rainbow population, certainly the UK is in the same position. And those who have made visits from time to time to my country will feel astonishment at the rapidity with the, which our society has changed from being a, a, a state which was protected by the fact that it was within an island to a state where uh, there is no longer the protection which an island has because access can be obtained in so many ways. And the law in England has had to develop and cater for this situation. And it was the exchanges to which I've referred which I believe helped us do so. Because what we found in Israel was that although there was no uh, established entrenched constitution, there were the basic rights, but equally there were principles which under their very distinguished presidents, your Supreme Court has developed, which provided a constitutional framework 
uh, to the legal system here. And we hadn't done that at the time 15 years ago when these exchanges started, but where we have done so uh, now. And where you have, in both our countries, such diverse backgrounds, it's especially important that their legal systems comply with the rule of law. There's an essential ingredient in achieving a society in which the law protects the interest of all its members. In the words of a, the oath or an affirmation that all judges in England make on being appointed, which goes back into the realm of history, there is a, a, a requirement that they have to administer justice so as to do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages of the realm. What this requires in practice is what I must now try to clarify. I do so based on the expending my working life in the, in the legal world, and in particular, of course, the world, legal world of England. And what I would say is that while the rule of law is difficult to explain, what it is has involved in a way which is very positive and of very, very great benefit to the societies which comply with the rule of law. Part of the difficulty in describing what is involved in the rule of law is that it's not a rigid concept. There is no wholly satisfactory definition of what is meant by the rule of law. It's chameleon-like in that it takes its color from the circumstances in which the phrase is being used. However, I know of no developed nation that does not claim to adhere to the rule of law. But there are few nations that cannot with, be a, with justification be accused of failing to adhere to it in some respect, or at least some of the time. And this is certainly true of the United Kingdom as much as elsewhere, even though under English law, the UK's recognition of the rule of law can be traced back to Magna Carta, entered into by King John almost 800 years ago in 1215. Ma Magna Carta came both in England and in the United States to be regarded as an early statement of many of the basic freedoms that are now generally accepted to be constituents of the rule of law. The difficulty in defining, it perhaps explains why, despite the impressive length of its pedigree, as far as I am aware, the phrase did not appear in any United Kingdom statute until the Constitution Reform Act of 2005. Even that statute goes no further than to record in section one, and I read it so far as appropriate, that this act does not uh, adversely affect A, the ex existing constitutional principle of the rule of law. When I was still Lord Chief Justice, I traveled to China to give a lecture in the palace of the people to their senior mandarins and academics on the rule of law. At the end of the lecture, I was asked by a member of the audience, what was the distinction between the rule of law and the rule by law that had, be, that had no recognition in China? The question was astute. What the rule of law requires is uh, different from what is required by the rule by law. Rule by law requires no more 
then you are governed in accordance with the law of the land, regardless of the extent to which that law protects basic citizens' rights. Compliance with the rule of law, on the other hand, presupposes that there should be laws that are of a quality that will provide protection for basic rights of the citizen. Significantly, these include a right of access to independent courts to enforce those rights. A requirement of independent courts are dependent on there being independent judges. It is important to note that in deciding whether a particular country should be treated as observing the rule of law, a holistic approach, in my contention, should be adopted. The parameter of the rights involved, as I've indicated, are not rigidly fixed. It is the content of the rights that both collectively and individually has to be assessed. Before it can be said a country complies with the rule of law, it has to be seen that the answer to the question can vary according to the particular circumstances in a particular country at a particular time. Furthermore, with a few exceptions, after indiv individual rights are, qual are qualified and not absolute, there are usually those rights which are collectively described as human rights and as, that, as such can often need to be balanced one with another. Of the, of an example of, a, of the rights falling within this category are rights to privacy and the rights to freedom of expression. Frequently they are in direct conflict. Situations exist also where the right to life and the right to freedom from torture are involved. But in these situations, the rights are not qualified. The rights are absolute. And there is no question, but they have to be observed. The rights to which I have been refer referred to can all be regarded as being within the category of fundamental human rights recognized by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the General Assembly of, of the, uh, the newly established United Nations on the 10th of December 1948. It was adopted by 48 votes in favor, eight abstentions and no votes against. References can also be made to similar documents of the highest status proclaiming human rights, including the European Convention of 1950, the American Convention of 1969, the African Charter of 1981, and the Arab Convention of 1994. Based on this universal unanimity of approach to the need to recognize fundamental human rights contained in these documents is of the highest importance. I uh, treat these rights as being the rights that a state is required generally to respect in relation to its citizens in order to conform with the rule of law. In considering the quality of my country's adherence to the rule of law, I will refer to the European Convention for the terms of those rights of of its citizens were acquired to be protected in accordance with the rule of law by the Human Rights Act 1998. I've emphasized the date 1998 because it is relatively recent. The, the act was drafted so as to preserve the sovereignty of parliament, but in practical terms, unless and until the act is repealed, it means the citizens can enforce the rights in the Charter directly in the courts in the UK or applying for a decision in the European Court of Human Rights at Strasbourg. This provides substantial protection for the citizens in accord with the rule of law. 
This has brought about a substantial improvement in the position of the citizens in the matters about which we are discussing this afternoon. Prior to the Act, technically, the citizen was usually confined to enforcing the duties owed by the public bodies to the public in general. There were few private rights that were available to the public. This, as I understand it, and I'm certainly no expert here, was exactly the position, not in Israeli law, but in Jewish law. The, the situations in which the rights have to be assessed may sometimes seem to appear trivial at first sight, though they can often, notwithstanding that, have important points to make uh, underneath those uh, trivial facts. I mean, to take an example, in relevant recent times, in the UK, we had litigation which went up to the Supreme Court as to whether an air hostess can be prevented by her employers, British Airways, from wearing a cross around her neck when she is working. The courts gave a negative answer in the case of a booking clerk. But there was a similar case involving a nurse, and there they gave a, possible, a, a positive answer and said a nurse could be prevented if it could be shown that it could get in the way of her treating her patients. A prohibition could not be allowed on the grounds that the cross might offend Muslims or Jewish members of the community, but it could be on practical grounds of adversely affecting patients. So far I've traversed the foothills of my subject. May I now try and proceed to bring together the different aspects of the way in which UK law protects the rights of individuals who can be said to be or belong to minority groups. The starting point must be that generally under English law, everyone lawfully in England is equal. Equality under the law is a paramount principle of the raw rail of law. What this involved is ad admirably summarized in the International Covenant of Rights in Article 26, which states, all persons are equal before the law and are entitled without any discre discretion, discrimination to equal protection under the law. In this respect, the law shall prohibit any discrimination and guarantee to all persons equal and effective protection against discrimination on any ground such as race, colour, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. The, state, the spirit of Article 26 reflects the common law, the remedy of habeas corpus and the decision in Somerset's case of 1762 in which Lord Mansfield said of the Jamaican slave that as soon as a man sets foot on English ground, he is free. However, no right is worth the paper it's written on unless it can be enforced. Prior to the Legal Aid Act 1949, which gave a broad entitlement to legal aid, and my reforms in 1996 to the Civil Justice Act, the best that could be said of civil justice is that although the courts were open, like the Savoy Hotel, there is the subject to the, the, uh, uh, the, the subject to the person either receiving legal aid or being wealthy was unable to go to the courts to obtain the remedies they needed. However, over the years since 1949, the entitlement to legal aid has been substantially curtailed. The final re reduction was made in, in, only last year by an act which came into force 
uh, having passed through with difficulty through both houses of parliament. The, the government say it cannot afford to do more and claim our legal aid scheme is the most generous in the Western world, which may, may well be true, but doesn't detract from the unattractive nature of the situation it's produced. I'm relieved that in my civil justice reforms of 1998, I required judges of part, as part of their duty to do justice, so, as far, so far as possible, to achieve a level playing field between litigants who are of different means. This it b will at best marginally mitigate the reduction of legal aid, but surely must be in accord f with what justice and the rule of law requires. What constitutes discrimination has d changed over the years. In the UK, it's a salutary, salutary to remember that it was as recent as 1928 that universal suffrage was introduced by the legislature that g gave women unqualified rights to vote the same as men. Regrettably, government uh, now attempts to save money have not been confined to legal aid. The government has turned its attention to ju judicial review. That is the process which in, in England is performed by high court judges and in uh, Israel, the, its equivalent is dealt with by, by the Supreme Court as a high court. I as anticipate that these recent attempts, when they come to the House of Lords, will be subject to strenuous efforts to reduce their impact because the access to judicial review must be one of the basic rights of our citizens. There is no doubt that making the ECHR part of domestic law has been a catalyst that has increased the number of applications for judicial review. A, a rapid survey of the ECHR, the European Court, the European Covenant of Human Rights, explains why. Take, for example, nine, Article 9.1, uh, of the uh, covenant, which boldly proclaims everyone has the re right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his relig religion or belief and freedom either or alone or in community with others and in public or private to man manifest his religion or belief in worship, teaching, practice, or observance. To give proper weight to the language, it's necessary to recognize the full impact only applies to practices that take place in private. If your actions are in public, limits may be imposed by law requiring your rights to be exercised in a manner that does not impinge disproportionately on others. A controversial decision under Article 9 is that of the German Constitutional Court in which it was held that the practice of male circumcision required both by Muslim and Jewish religions is unacceptable. In the UK, this is not the position, but in the case of female circumcision, the law takes, in my view, a different view correctly. It is an offence for non-medical reasons to perform such an act, to take a British citizen or, or resident abroad for this purpose is a criminal offence. The broad language of Article 9 means that it is possible for different courts to take different views as to, in effect, exceptional situations like these. Personally, I regard this qualification as acceptable and Consider that Article 9 sets a standard which should enable the majority of different fa faiths to live together without curtailing unreasonably the freedom to practice their different religions. P support for Article 9 is to be found in Article 14, which provides the enjoyment of rights and freedoms set forth in the Convention 
so shall be secured without discrimination on any ground, such as sex, race, color, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, association with a national minority, property, birth or other status. Articles 9 and 14 in English law are also supported by a number of domestic statutes and regulations, approximately 30 in number. In the spheres of employment and housing, there's extensive, extensive legislation pre preventing discrimination. In support, for example, <laughs> they make it an offence to promote social tensions by the use of hate language. The policy of English law of, of deterring discrimi discrimination, discriminatory activities so far as this is practical, without duly obtruding upon free speech, is clear. However, when there is a basic aspect of UK culture which is in debate, it's preferable that progress is made not by the courts but by Parliament. There are at the moment two pieces of legislation proceeding in Parliament where the democratic process is engaged and the issues have be not been left for the courts to determine. Neither of the subjects of that legislation would, until recently, have been likely to be the subject of legislation. The first one is that which uh, is uh, going through Parliament and indeed which will be debated in the House of Lords, where I am privileged to be a member, when I, just after I return uh, to London. It's answering the question, is it appropriate for a person who is ill and has got a terminal illness to be assisted in terminating his life prematurely? And the other is whether it's right for two people who are of the same sex to marry and not merely be in a civil partnership which is very close to marriage, which is already permitted by English law. Both are topics on which there are deep divisions within our society, and they are to be subject to a free vote in Parliament. And there's huge canvassing going on outside the normal party process to try and find what should be the solution. If this is the standard which the rule of law requires within a nation, surely it's also the, a standard that should be adopted between nations. Furthermore, the promoting of the standard as part of the rule of law can only be positive for international relations. The position is, however, frequently complicated by misunderstanding of what different faiths require or, more likely, are thought to require. The misunderstandings usually occur innocently due to ignorance, but can result from deliberate action on the part of those who wish to damage relations between different faiths. In both situations, there is an important role for education to play. I am delighted that both the Wolf Institute and this university have bodies which have been established to understand what are the basic requirements of the different Abrahamic faiths and to show that they're nothing like as sharp or as close as popular belief suggests. I do, however, re-emphasize in determining whether a particular country is or, or is not committed to upholding the rule of law, it's not to be, this is not to be determined by examining a single alleged infraction, but in a holistic and flexible manner based on the generality of the, ge of the country's conduct. I also recognize that a country usually has a margin of appreciation when considering the valu validity of its compliance. In the, the United Kingdom at the moment, there's some, in some quarters, strong criticism of the courts who have developed the rights of the individual in upholding the rule of law. I believe it's possible that in some quarters in Israel there's a similar concern. 
it would be inappropriate for me to comment about the position in Israel, and I do not do so. As to the UK, I regret it's not sufficiently widely understood that it's not only minorities that are protected by the courts upholding the rights, but majorities as well. Above all, there's a lack of appreciation that in our multicultural, disparate societies, the fact that our courts are continuously struggling to uphold impartially the balance between the different interests of different individuals and groups of individuals, irrespective of their respective positions in society, is fundamental to the ability of people within a society to live at peace. This is why the rule of law is so important and why Jews such as myself can be totally committed to Israel, yet, at the still, uh, yet still decide to continue to live in the UK, confident that in the knowledge that their rights as a minority will be protected. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your such an interesting talk about the rule and, uh, of law and rule and equality under the law in a multicultural uh, society or societies and also for making such an uh, <coughs> uh, interesting uh, um, comparison with our society here in Israel, which is also a kind of an island, maybe imaginary island. <laughs> Thank you.